You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. We're glad you're watching a Bible answer today. We have three gospel preachers with us all this month. They've been doing a great job. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hello, my name is Brent Arnold, and I'm the preacher for the Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee. Greetings, my name is Serge Shoemaker, and I work with the Glendale Church of Christ in New Bern, Tennessee. And my name is Tim Howard. I'm the minister of the Sanford Church of Christ in the Missouri Boot Hill near the town of Steele. We're grateful to these brethren and grateful to you for watching. We hope you'll tell other people about a Bible answer and where it may be seen in your area. We've got some great questions today. Let's get right to them. Our first question goes to Brother Arnold. The person says, when Jesus returns in the air, that's when the dead in Christ are to rise in the air to meet him, and then those who are left are to meet him also. Does the judgment happen then, Brother Arnold? Well, it seems that the uh, passage that you're referencing in this question is 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 14 through 17. It's one of my favorites. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... Them also which sleep in Jesus, sleep here being a figurative reference of death, those who have died in a, uh, a good relationship or good standing with the Lord. It, it says, those God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or not have an advantage over those who asleep, or in other words, those who die before the coming of the Lord. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a day that will be when all of the dead will be raised and even uh, those who alive, are alive and remain, we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And this mortality will put on immortality, and we will have an opportunity to be with the Lord forever. And our question in reference to this is, is this when the judgment occurs? Well, this passage talks about the coming of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. And in other passages, we can see that the judgment is connected to both of those events, the coming of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead. For example, in, in uh, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 34, the Bible says that when the Son of Man shall come, there's the coming, in His glory and all His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. They shall in, and then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the, of the world. And later on in that same context, he says to those on the left hand, Depart from me. And so, yes, the judgment is connected to the coming of Christ. And upon the occurrence of His coming with the angels, He will sit on that throne and uh, will judge all nations, all people, and separate the faithful from the unfaithful and uh, issue uh, uh, an eternal reward for those who are faithful and an eternal punishment for those who have been unfaithful. The conclusion of that, that chapter is Matthew 25, 46, which says, These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So we see a connection between the judgment and the coming of Christ. There's also a connection with the resurrection. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 13, it says, The sea gave up the dead which were in it, um, and death and Hades, or hell, 
delivered up the dead which were in them. To, uh, that to me is a, fig a figurative reference to the resurrection. Uh, the, the sea giving up the dead and, and death and hell delivering up the dead which was in them. And what happens upon that occurrence is they were judged every man according to their works. The books are open, uh, the book of life, uh, the, the book of, uh, of scripture, the book of, of our lives, the book of our works. All of those books will be open and examined and an eternal decision will be made uh, at that time. And so, yes, this is when the occurrence of uh, the judgment will take place. Thank you so much for this question. Thank you. Now to Brother Shoemaker, what about modesty constraints if you are a caregiver or medical worker and helping people of the opposite sex in their time of need? Brother Shoemaker. I want to begin this answer by saying how very much I appreciate uh, those who are willing to devote their lives caring for others by treating their conditions or rendering assistance to those who are unable to fully care for themselves. My family has been blessed in its associations with several such individuals during our own time of need. I appreciate even more those who are willing to do so while striving to maintain respect for God's teachings. These individuals are to be doubly commended in my estimation. Now, concerning the issues of modesty, the Christian should strive to maintain and respect modesty at all times. Genesis chapter 9 records the shameful incident of Noah becoming drunk and uncovering his nakedness. One of his sons, Canaan, looked upon his father's nakedness, and the scriptures suggest a uh, prolonged and, and willful look. For that, Canaan was cursed. In contrast, Noah's other sons, Shem and Japheth, went to great lengths to respect and protect their father's modesty, even walking backwards with gaze averted as they did their best to cover their father. And as a consequence, they were blessed. Now notice from this example that even in cases where the same gender is involved, like sons interacting with their father, principles of modesty do remain. So wherever possible, modesty should be maintained and respected. But of course, such isn't always possible, particularly in medical or caregiving fields, and I believe the scriptures do acknowledge that. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the victim who had been robbed had also, according to Luke 10 and verse 30, been stripped of his clothing, left in an immodest condition. But that didn't prevent the Samaritan from rendering aid, including binding and caring for his injuries and wounds. In Luke chapter 8, we read of the miraculous healing of a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years, likely some sort of menstrual complication. But the sensitive nature of her condition did not prevent her from seeking the aid of physicians who in that day and age would have all but certainly been men. Now, notice that is a case where you would have had men examining and treating the most intimate physical areas of this woman. Similarly, it was a group of women who came to the tomb of Jesus with the intention of anointing His body, according to Mark 16 and verse 1. In these and, and similar situations, we see then it is not sinful to deal with the body of another person for medical or hygienic reasons, even a person of the opposite sex or gender. Such is ultimately, I believe, no different from caring for a small child or aging parent who are unable to care for themselves. Now, all of that being said, allow me to offer up some recommendations drawn from the Scriptures. First of all, nothing should be done that violates the conscience of either the caregiver or the patient. If that means finding someone of the same gender as the patient to handle a task for the sake of conscience, then that is what should be done. Relatedly, the golden rule should be followed, and the patient should be treated as we would want to be treated. If we were in their situations, unable to care for ourselves, we would want someone to help us, but we would also want someone to help us in as respectful a manner as possible. 
that might involve things like keeping the head turned and eyes averted as much as possible, or maybe positioning gowns or sheets so that body parts are not visible to those who absolutely do not need to see them. And finally, while I have geared this answer primarily towards the caregiver, it's equally important to realize that the patient should also be respectful of the caregiver and not willfully do anything with regards to modesty that might make the caregiver, whoever he or she might be, uncomfortable. In short, it is absolutely a good thing to render aid to those in need. It's an even better thing to do so while respecting the principles of modesty as much as the needs of the situation permit. Thank you for asking this good question. Thank you very much. You know, that is a practical question. These matters do come up, and I appreciate the fine way in which he answered that question. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free track. Our track today is entitled, How to Rebuild Trust in Marriage. If you'd like to have our free track or our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course, or to send us your question, just contact us. You may write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can reach us by our website, www.abibleanswertv.org. Of course, our past programs are archived there for your viewing, as well as on our YouTube channel. To find it, all you have to do is look for a Bible Answer TV, all small letters. Just search that, and you'll find our YouTube channel. You can email us at a Bible Answer at earthlink.net, or you can call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463. Now back to our questions and Brother Howard. Someone has asked, why do you believe Christians may fall from grace? Brother Howard. Well, I think the, the question really should be, um, what does the Bible teach about falling from grace? And the, it is interesting that every New Testament book in the Bible states that a Christian can fall from grace. And I'm, we don't have time to go through all of them, but I'm going to try to hit as many uh, as I can possible uh, in our time remaining uh, in this question. Matthew 25, 14, the parable of the talents. Um, the one talent servant was cast out. The, the servants represent Christians who are following the master's will. And since the, the servant did not do what the master told him, he was cast out. In Mark chapter 4, the parable of the soils. Uh, again, the, the Christians, the seed is the word of God that, that went into the di different types of soils. And there was seed that took root and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the, it began to grow. But the Christian's faith was choked by thorns. And so again, this Christian left the faith. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira were Christians who died in sin. In Acts chapter 8, Peter told Simon, who had just obeyed the gospel, became a Christian, to repent of his sin or else he would be lost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see where a Christian at the church of Corinth had his father's wife. And, and Paul said that, that they were to deliver this one to Satan that his soul might be saved. Again, if that man repented, which fortunately we see in 2 Corinthians, he did. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul says, a Christian who thinks he stands must take heed lest he fall. Once again, that's written to we as Christians. Take heed lest you fall from grace. Galatians 5, 4, writing to Christians, you have fallen from grace. That is about as, as plain and clear language as we can find. Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Why do we need to restore someone if he has not fallen away? And there again, why consider ourselves being tempted if we cannot fall away as Christians? Philippians 2, 12, Paul says, Work out your own salvation, with fear and trembling. Well, once again, as Christians, why should we be fearful if we cannot fall from grace? 1 Timothy 4, 1, the Spirit says, some will depart from the faith. That means to apostatize, to leave. So the, the Spirit says that some Christians will depart from the faith. 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith, 
and is worse than an unbeliever. So here Paul says that a Christian can be worse than an unbeliever who is lost. Hebrews 3 verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Once again, why are we as Christians? It's, it's written to brethren Christians. Why should we beware in departing from the living God if, again, we cannot do that? In James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, we're talking about we as Christians, if we wander from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So here again is another passage indicating that we can fall away. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Well, once again, if, if, uh, why would Satan attempt to get Christians to fall if we cannot? And why, again, resist him if we cannot fall away? In, uh, in 2 Peter chapter, chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, Peter says, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, A dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. And then he concludes that thought in chapter 317, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, there's that word again, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of your wicked. So once again, we see where Peter uh, says that uh, we can, if a person becomes a Christian and then falls away, the, the latter end is worse than the beginning. So it shows us that we can fall away. Just a couple more, Revelation 2, 1 through 7. The church at Ephesus had fallen. And, and Jesus said that, they, that their candlestick would be removed unless they repented of that. In Revelation 3, 5, a Christian can have his name blotted out of the book of life. And then in 1 John 1, 7, says, If we walk in the light, the blood of Christ cleanses us of our sins. There's that word, if. If we walk in the light, the blood of Christ cleanses us of our sins, which means if we do not, then the blood of Christ will not. So just as we can choose to follow the Lord, we can choose to fall away from the Lord. Now the good news is, Paul tells us in Romans 8, 38 and 39, that nothing outside of us can separate us from the love of Christ. There's no power on earth, including Satan himself, that can snatch us away from the grace of God. But we can choose to, to leave Christ just as we once chose to follow Him. So I hope that these, these verses and passages helps to answer that very good question. Thank you. To Brother Arnold, what is the new hermeneutic? Brother Arnold. Well, just in case uh, anyone might not be familiar with these terms, uh, a hermeneutic is a, a process for um, using certain logical principles uh, to uh, applying them to a document in order to ascertain the author's original meaning. Now, as we apply that to the scripture, our, our hope is to understand what the original inspired writers uh, meant by the things that, that are written in these books of the Bible. And so we apply a number of uh, procedures in order to try to ascertain that. We try to uh, become familiar with the author, the recipients, the, the uh, historical background of the time that the document was written. written. We look at the words that they're used and how they're used and, and, and other forms of language from that uh, that time period. There are any number of uh, procedures that we go through in order to try to ascertain what the, the author originally meant by, by this writing. 
obviously whatever they meant is what God meant for us to know uh, from, from these passages. We also use hermeneutical principles in order to try to discern what is approved by God and what's not approved by God in matters of doctrine, matters of practice, worship, organization, and those kinds of things. So we look for a, a, a logical uh, procedure that we can use in order to try to draw some firm conclusions in these areas. And so we, we lay out principles like this. It, if we want to determine if something's authorized or not, we look for a command in Scripture. If God commanded it, then obviously He has authorized it to be practiced in His church today. Or, or we look for approved examples. If there's an example of someone doing this and God approved of their doing it, then there is a, a, a conclusion there that God would approve of, of our doing the same. And, and from that, we, we recognize that the things that are necessary to expedite a command, those things that would be authorized as well. And, and, and furthermore, anything that is implied in Scripture uh, also would be uh, binding in that way. And, and furthermore, we uh, follow this principle of equally representing and or excuse me equally respecting the silence of the bible uh, that if that command or that example is not there uh, then that particular uh, uh, practice would be considered unauthorized the the concept of the new hermeneutic which by the way this is a vague term that can be um, used in a lot of different ways but speaking in generalities um, the new hermeneutic reflects a desire for church policy to adapt with the changes of culture. And, and per, uh, commonly the proponents of this idea assert that this old hermeneutic, which I've just uh, put before you, is a man-made tradition that has been perpetuated by the likes of Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, and other uh, pioneers of the Restoration Movement. The new hermeneutic holds that no conclusion which has been drawn from the result of human reasoning can be established as a test of Christian, uh, Christian fellowship. And only fundamentals such as the existence of God, the lordship of Jesus, uh, the Bible authority, the church, and the plan of salvation can be considered binding on Christians. All other doctrinal matters uh, are viewed as secondary and as non-binding. Well, um, the fact of the matter is that the r rational process that we use to uh, discern right from wrong and authorize from unauthorized is the same reasoning process we have to use to come to conclusions about those fundamentals. Uh, if we have to use a, a r the uh, human reasoning to draw conclusions about the existence of God, then we can use that same reasoning in other areas of, of faith and doctrine. Uh, and in fact, the Lord sets a, an example for us, I believe, in Matthew 22, verses 29 through 32. Here, there was a discussion between Jesus and the Sadducees who did not believe in angels and the afterlife. And they posed a situation to Jesus about a man who was married and, and then he died and the, the, the wife married his brother. And this continued uh, six more times. And they wanted to know, whose wife will she be in, in the resurrection, if there is a resurrection? And Jesus' response to this was, starting in verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that, he, that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Jesus has drawn a, a firm conclusion about the afterlife, and he has used deductive reasoning to do it. It's based off a statement that God made at the burning bush to Moses. And even though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead for many years prior to this event, God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus draws a conclusion based off the tense of one word there, am. Not I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you notice how 
uh, Jesus uses deductive reasoning to draw a firm conclusion about the afterlife. And, and so much so that he, he says that the Sadducees were in error and did not know the, the scriptures because they had not used the same deductive reasoning to draw this conclusion. Now this subject matter is not what uh, new hermeneutic proponents would consider a, a fundamental issue. But it is nonetheless an, a, 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 an important issue to the Lord and one uh, in which these people were considered to be in error. I reject the concepts of the new hermeneutic. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 4, 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. We need to be using the rationality that God has given us to follow that principle as closely as possible. I, I believe the old hermeneutic that has been used enable us to do that. If we follow commands and examples and inferences like that, we can speak where the oracles of God speak and, and be silent where the oracles of God are silent. And um, uh, God has place, uh, placed that binding uh, principle upon us and it's certainly something that we need to continue to respect today. Thank you so much for this question. Thank you to Brother Arnold, Brother Shoemaker, Brother Howard. We're doing such a good job today answering your questions. Well, I, uh, I heard about a defender of this new hermeneutic movement who said, thus neither of us can ever state that the other man could be wrong. And I think that really gets to the bottom of it because by that view there is no right, there is no wrong established by the scriptures. More and more people have lost respect for the authority of the scriptures. And uh, they use this type of reasoning and it leaves man with no pattern and no way to determine right and wrong. Really it makes man a law unto himself. But as we have seen and as he has shown uh, the Bible authorizes by direct statement and by accounts of approved action and by implication, biblical authorization can come through any of those three areas. And uh, we ought not to compromise our hermeneutical approach to the scriptures. We try to make something subjective which is actually objective. Friends, thanks for watching A Bible Answer today. We appreciate it so much. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.